Hi and welcome. So my name is Sandra Bhattacharya. I teach history of medicine at the, at the Department of History at, at the University of York, and I also uh, am part of the team uh, that runs the Center for Global Health Histories, which is a WHO collaborating center. And today, uh, as you know, we are organizing the World Health Organization Global Health History Seminar 121, which deals with the creation uh, and expansion of the glo Global Smallpox Eradication Program. The idea behind uh, uh, this event is to fill a long-standing historical gap uh, 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 in, in the history of smallpox eradication. In 1958 and 59, the World Health Assembly, which uh, sort of uh, uh, oversees the work of the World Health Organization, voted for a worldwide smallpox eradication program. Um, majority of the member states of the World Health Assembly actually voted for this resolution. The idea was proposed by the Soviet Union based on epidemiological data uh, from its own territory um, and its uh, representatives noted that they had limited the impact of the disease within the Soviet Union uh, through uh, effective surveillance and vaccination. But as the USSR uh, advocated global smallpox eradication, uh, its uh, Vice Minister for Health, Zhdanov, was also very honest about a weakness in the Soviet program that had caused him uh, to come to the World Health Assembly and recommend global action. Zhdanov mentioned that despite the fact that the Soviet Union had got rid of smallpox uh, on several occasions, there would be reimportations of the disease from surrounding countries, like Iran uh, uh, or Afghanistan. So the message he wanted to give the World Health Assembly was that the world needed to work together to make sure that the disease was gone for good. Now existing historical work is focused primarily on the period uh, from the second half of the 1960s. That is, a period after the United States Centers for Disease Control organized an organized, uh, a, a, a well-funded uh, vaccination uh, program in 20 countries of Western Africa. And after success was achieved in uh, Western Africa, uh, CDC, the US CDC got involved in work in South Asia and, and at the end, Eastern Africa, the Horn of Africa, Somalia, and Ethiopia. Now this event draws on detailed evidence-based research prepared by four scholars to do two things. One, to show that the international engagements between 1958 and 68 were rich and important. So, we raise the question here, why has the period between 1958 and 1967, when the, the call for intensification of the smallpox eradication program began, why has that period been ignored? Secondly, this event draws on four very important case studies where significant progress was made in relation to smallpox surveillance, vaccination, to the extent that a country like China, the blue, will talk about smallpox is actually elim eliminated uh, from within China by the time intensification begins. You have to remember here it's a country of a billion people, and yet the existing history, institutional history of the WHO, for example, does not really pay due attention to how the successes in China made it easier for international groups of officials to advocate 
a wider smallpox eradication program. So we'll have uh, uh, colleagues also look at Brazil, India, and Nepal, which is, again, a fascinating case study which the official history of the WHO actually recognizes as being an exception to the rule. So we are delighted to have a speaker focus on that. There can be no doubt that histories of smallpox eradication help us prepare better for international action against infectious disease and promote future vaccination projects and plans at an international level. But I do believe that for such history-led preparation to be effective, it is incumbent on us, professional historians, to prepare a more complex and realistic history that does not exclude the many hundreds of thousands involved in preparing and running national chapters of an international worldwide eradication program. So I'm not going to labor this point further. I'd like to introduce our four speakers to you. We have Lu Chen, who's a member of uh, the Center for Global Health History. She's on a Welcome Trust PhD studentship. For, following Lu will be Dr. Susan Hayden, who's a social pharmacist and historian from the University of Otago, New Zealand, who we are delighted to welcome in New York. Then we're going to have Dr. Carlos Campani, who's hiding behind the screen, must have seen him. And uh, he is currently in the Department of Health Sciences at the University of York uh, um, and uh, is a clinician by profession uh, and has practiced for many years in Brazil. His case study will be on Brazil. And then we have our own Dr. Namrata Ganeri, who's a Commonwealth uh, Fellow, Commonwealth Rutherford Fellow uh, at the University of York, but is a permanent member of staff in the Department of History in SNDT University in Mumbai, India. And she will be talking to us about relatively ignored aspects of the Indian program. Last but not the least, we have a wonderful colleague from Zimbabwe, an elder from Africa who everyone should listen to, Dr. Godfrey Sikipa, who will comment for about 10 minutes about all these presentations. I mean, Godfrey is one of those elders who has seen these programs in action. And if I might add, I, I, I really feel that what we have uh, in relation to the smallpox eradication program in Africa is a U.S centered interpretation of what happened in Africa. What is still needed is an Africa-centered understanding of what happened in relation to smallpox eradication uh, in, 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 across that wondrous, very diverse continent. And I hope Godfrey will be able to fire up some young researchers at his end to follow up this work. So without further ado, do welcome, please. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. And I'm going to share some um, experience of smallpox eradication in China. And China is a very specific case in worldwide smallpox eradication um, because the whole program happened before the intensified program started. So um, um, in 1949, the Communism Party won the Civil War and built People's Republic of China. And in 1952, the China withdrew from the United Nations system and didn't recover its representation until 1971. So during 1949 to 1971, there was no direct information exchange between China and WHO. And however, after World War II, in 1950s, smallpox was highly endemic in China. So we can see this map on the left hand. There were more than 50,000 cases in China in 1950, and compared to the other countries, although there were, um, were less cases than India, but there were more cases probably than Nepal and Brazil. And there were also other communicable diseases in China in 1950s. Although smallpox was not the most prevalent communicable disease, but it was a one of the most fatal communicable diseases. Um, so, uh, so the fatality rate could reach almost 20% in this chart. Uh, 
and the smallpox eradication in China actually started from 1950, when the Prime Minister announced the uh, announced a decision that to carry out a mass smallpox vaccination pro uh, program for the whole population of mainland China. And there were three rounds of mass vaccination in total. So the first round of mass vaccination was from 1950 to 1953. And the smallpox had been eradicated, had been eradicated in eastern coast areas, like um, eastern coast areas in here. And we can see smallpox has been eradicated in big cities like Beijing, Tianjin, and Shanghai. For the other areas, smallpox epidemic had been reduced to a very low level. And the second round of mass vaccination was from 1950 to 1958. And uh, smallpox had been eradicated in the northeastern China or northwestern China, most of the areas. And the third round of mass vaccination came in 1960. And because there were an outbreak in Yunnan province, and those cases were believed to be introduced from India, Nepal here, and also Burma. So the border areas have, uh, were given the first priority. And after this round, smallpox had been eradicated in Pro Yunnan province. And this was believed to be the last case and was written in a report submitted to the WHO in 1979. But after the certification, the, uh, the Chinese government found there, were, there was another round of outbreak in Shanxi and Inner Mongolia. So uh, the, those cases were caused by human inoculation materials. So there was actually another round of outbreak in, from 1964 to 1965. But the last case was in 1965. So, Except for the mass vaccination, there was also the regular vaccination program. So in 1950, the, minister, uh, the Ministry of Health ruled that all children should be vaccinated within six months after birth and revaccinated every six years after they are born until they are 18 years old. And um, in 1953, China also built an epidemic prevention system and uh, for the smallpox surveillance, it's also very important. In 1955, the uh, rule that smallpox or suspected cases should be reported within six hours in urban areas and within 12 hours in rural areas. So because of those mass vaccination, regular vaccination and surveillance system, smallpox was eradicated in China in 1955. But however, during 1950s and 60s, China was, the situation in China was deficiency of food supply and very low economic growth. So we can see from this chart that it shows daily per capita supply of calories. And the yellow line represents China, and we can see in 19, uh, 1959 there's a great drop down. Um, it's because of the great famine in China, and uh, the food supply level in China in 1960s, it was lower than India. And also the economic growth was in a similar level. This is the GDP per capita um, shows uh, different countries and the green line represents China. So the GDP in China, in, at least in 1960s, it was in the similar level with India and Nepal. So the question is how did China reach the smallpox eradication independently under the circumstances of uh, deficiency of food supply and low economic growth? And there were several uh, factors I would to highlight. So the first, I think the first reason was the political reason, and there were technical factors and social historical factors, and uh, finally was the social mobilization. So uh, first one, I think it comes from the Chinese government's commitment on improving public health in general. So smallpox eradication was not an isolated program in China. It was integrated into an overall national health movement against all major endemic and epidemic diseases. So it was called Patriotic Health Campaign. The Patriotic Health Campaign aimed to improve health for socialism constructions. So except for smallpox, there were other diseases were targeted for elimination or eradication as well. For example, the schistomyces and tuberculosis and malaria. And also the government was aimed to improve the uh, environment house as well. So from mouth speech in 1956, so we can see the leaders in China all consider the disease and poor sanitation as an enemy of the progress toward modernity. 
and build the new um, socialism country. Therefore, the government committed to improve, uh, improve public health in general, although this purpose was very uh, highly, highly political and ideological. Mm. Okay. The second important reason was the independent ability of manufacturing smallpox vaccines. Actually, before 1949, China started to do uh, research on smallpox vaccines since 1912. So the first research institute, uh, smallpox uh, vaccine research institute, was built in 1912. And in 1926, Chinese scientists developed uh, um, a vaccine stream called Temple of Heaven stream, and it was used in the later uh, manufacturing of smallpox vaccines. Um, so after 1949, the government took over those vaccine research and manufacturing institutes. So in 1950s, there were five, five big uh, manufacturing centers in China, and um, they were in Beijing here, and uh, Dalian here, and Shanghai, and Lanzhou, and uh, here in Kunming. So those, man uh, so those manufacturing centers cover different areas in China. So the vaccines don't have to be, didn't have to be shipped for a long distance. And during the second round of mass vaccination, they also developed a freeze-dried vaccine as well. So those vaccine producing centers, they manufacture a large amount of vaccines during 1950s, 1950s to 60s. So uh, here is the chart shows um, how many doses had been issued during 1950s to 60s. So in 1952, there were nearly 300 million doses of vaccine had been issued, which covered nearly 46% of the population. Okay. So the third important factor was social historical factor, because smallpox vaccination was highly accepted among Chinese people. In ancient China, uh, people started to use uh, human inoculation to prevent smallpox. Um, so during uh, 18th and 19th centuries, smallpox vaccination had already been um, highly accepted along Yangtze River here and also the eastern coastal areas. So after uh, genarian vaccination in, introduced to China in 18th century, um, uh, each government had organized uh, a vaccination programs. So before uh, so actually, when it started in the 1950s and 60s, and smallpox vaccination had already been accepted by the majority of people. Um, although there were um, some resistance was reported in Yunnan province here, and border areas where minority groups lived. Um, so the last factor was social mobilization. And because this is a very huge program, has uh, the whole population participated, and how to convince people to get vaccinated is an uh, uh, interesting thing. And uh, the first thing was to connect those hatred and fear towards enemies with disease. Um, in 1952, the Chinese government accused the United States military use biological weapons during Korean War. Uh, although this validity of the accusation was not clear, the Chinese government used the germ war warfare to push political reform in China and launched a patriotic health campaign. So like the posters here doing patriotic health campaign, um, it said resolute cut off the bloody and criminal hand of American aggressors that spread germs. So they delivered a both message that China was threatened by American aggression and by natural bacteria, so it was very important for Chinese people to fight against both enemies. So the hatred emotions toward enemies and disease provoked people's enthusiasm to participate in those vaccination programs. Okay, so the second, uh, the second thing for social mobilization is to transfer the expert knowledge to general public. Because in 1950s and 60s, the illiteracy rate in China was very high. So in 1949, the illiteracy rate was 80%, and in 1964, there were still more than half the people who couldn't read. So how to teach them those knowledge about smallpox and vaccination? And the first thing um, 
is uh, during the mass vaccination program, the local government would usually organize some training sessions here and to teach people about the smallpox and the vaccines. And they will also use radio broadcast to broadcast the uh, knowledge. And uh, some local cadres and uh, leaders will go to people's house to do persuasion, to do peer pressure persuasion, persuade people to get vaccinated. And uh, they will also use some other art performance, like folk, uh, traditional folk art, and to, uh, to performance the smallpox and the vaccination. And uh, the local government would, uh, would also print those posters and education fleet or publish some uh, cosmic books about smallpox and prevention. So, uh, for example, a poster like this, it tells people everybody should get vaccinated and prevent smallpox. And on the top left corner, it shows the symptoms and the consequence of smallpox. And uh, on the top right corner, it shows what what should you do after there were smallpox cases? First, you have to report and then isolate the patient and then get vaccinated and then sterilize the patient's house. And on the, on the, down, uh, on the right, uh, left, left bottom corner is that smallpox, how smallpox was transmitted by direct contact with patients or by using the uh, belongings patients have used. So on the right and left hand said, um, completely defeat American imperialism's germ warfare and everybody should participate in the patriotic health campaigns. So uh, those pictures are very uh, clear to show um, this, the, the knowledge about smallpox and also use a format people could understand. And uh, one, another important thing was the vaccinators. And because in 1950s and 60s, there was not enough uh, medical professionals in China. So lots of vaccinators were selected among people. For example, the local cadres, local leaders, or school teachers, uh, or some medical school students. They were selected to uh, give some, to, to some um, short-term trainings, uh, to teach them how to use a multipuncture vaccination to vaccinate people. Because those vaccinators were actually confirmed people and uh, they're already familiar and trust, so it's easier for people to get vaccinated. Okay. So all of those achievements had not been acknowledged by the WHO until late 1970s. So although the WHO tried to get information when the global program launched in 1967, but nothing had been learned, and in 1977, when the last case appeared in Somalia, the WHO started to increase its communication with Chinese government regarding about the certification, because China was a very big country, has a billion population. Um, however, in the first place, the Chinese government was very reluctant to cooperate, so they spent two years to negotiate with each other. And fin finally, in 1979, um, China was agreed to be certified by the WHO and uh, agreed to be visited by a um, global commission team and also uh, submit a country report. Um, so the case in the China, um, WHO actually had a, a very limited role and very limited impact. Uh, impact. So the uh, smallpox, in China, smallpox eradication in China was placed into the existing public health structures and adapted to the local, political, social, geographical, cultural, and its epidemiological realities. So the, um, those people who contributed most to the smallpox eradication in China were the national and regional health officials, scientists who did research on the smallpox vaccines, and also those local health workers and the vaccinators. Um, so I think it's important to learn the experience in the early stage, in 1950s and 60s, and to learn the experience from those people whose names haven't been known, and whose stories haven't been told, and whose voices haven't been heard. And this is all I want to share. Thank you very much for listening.
we've seen the vast scale of the Chinese contribution. I think my presentation is very much about a small program. Sandwich between the regional powers of India and China is the small Himalayan state of nation state of Nepal. And its upper status uh, has been a key feature of its external relations. The mountains in the picture here are part of the northern border with the Tibet Autonomous Region of China. In those previous slides, some of those, Nepal was the little blank bit in the middle of um, a sea of information. We know very little about what happened in Nepal in this early period. Nepal, with a population of 9 to 10 million, was one of the last group of countries in the world to eradicate the disease. Now, the eradication program was about vaccination, surveillance, and containment. We should not forget that Nepalese people's experiences were also of a common and dreadful disease looked after mainly at home. The World Health Assembly goal was worldwide eradication, and so programs in small countries matter and need to be part of the historiography. WHO Project Nepal 9 refers to the WHO assist, um, the assisted smallpox program that operated throughout the worldwide eradication program from its introduction um, in early 1962, first as the smallpox control pilot project in the Kathmandu Valley, before becoming a smallpox eradication program that was then gradually expanded throughout the country. From the perspective of the Nepalese government in the capital Kathmandu, smallpox was part of the wider context of communicable disease control. Other diseases were bigger problems. In the monumental official history of the eradication program, which for Nepal is the only published account, Nepal, in nine pages, was presented as, quote, an epidemiological extension of the Indian states of Bihar and Uttar Pradesh, which it bordered to the south. Hence my picture of the mountains to the north to rather to contradict that, um, that image. The pilot project was dismissed as, quote, poorly funded, poorly supervised, and poorly executed. Everything that mattered in terms of the eradication program occurred after the introduction of the intensified program beginning in 1968, and particularly after 1971. Nepal, however, adopted a novel strategy of mass vaccination for one month annually to support the surveillance and containment activities. Comments from WHO HQ went from despair to praise. Nepal was no longer classified as an endemic country in 1973. Its last case of smallpox was in 1975, and the disease was declared eradicated in 1977. So even in the official history, Nepal was regarded as exceptional. Today, however, I don't want to talk about these later stages, but instead want to consider Nepal at the time of the pilot in the early 1960s. Epidemic smallpox spread throughout many parts of the country and the wider region in 1963, and it revealed the fractured, limited, yet, quote, global world of smallpox, of responses to disease. To the disease. So I want to suggest that this period is key to understanding what happened later. And the pilot project, despite its limitations, provided the foundation from which Nepal's first nationwide health program developed. So my talk examines epidemic smallpox in 1963 to 1964, which was Nepal's last major epidemic. It's missing in the official record. And secondly, the WHO project Nepal 9, the smallpox control pilot project. Part of my conclusion we'll actually see more of an introduction to Nepal. But I don't want to put it at the beginning. The difficulties of working in Nepal are usually given to, exp 
explain why things don't work. But the smallpox was eradicated despite these challenges. Much of the writing of Nepal's history focuses on the Kathmandu Valley. But for the epidemic, we can at least look at two other areas. In both, non-expert foreigners were involved in vaccination activities. Both are almost invisible in official records, but we know about them mainly because these foreigners wrote about them. So my title slide was a picture of the highest mountain in the world. The lure of climbing Mount Everest brought climbers but also, unexpectedly, smallpox. The second area is Lamjung District in central Nepal, where there were two US Peace Corps volunteers. Now this map, although it's later, but it does show the valleys of the Mount Everest area, which is what I want to talk about. And you can see Nepal's position between China and India in the corner. Now, with the Everest area epidemic that I want to talk about, the timeline is, is, is key. Um, it's really um, it was important because what happened, it's two weeks, it takes two weeks to walk from Kathmandu to the Mount Everest area. And that in the development of smallpox is a key is that important time. So we have a young Sherpa who goes to Kathmandu looking for expedition work as a porter. He becomes infected with smallpox, but the symptoms will appear later. We know from the accounts on the 20th of February, the American Mount Everest expedition departs Kathmandu, sets off on its two-week walk. 6th of March, the young Sherpa is diagnosed with smallpox near Namchi Bazaar, one of the villages on the map. Now, a few days later, 12th of March, New Zealander Sir Edmund Hillary's expedition leaves Kathmandu. 26th of March meets its first case of smallpox near another village in the area, Lukla. So, and from then, epidemic spreads along these narrow valleys to the villages, and that's what leads to their the um, expeditions, vaccination activities. They set out um, to vaccinate. So let's go. So in the end, um, they vaccinate uh, about 7,000 people, probably double the immediate area, and it spans into the um, uh, surrounding villages. And they know of about 25 deaths uh, I've got little really about numbers because in the context of Nepal, numbers actually don't mean, mean anything and they probably grossly um, underestimate what is actually happening. Now in this episode, the foreigners were independent, they largely operated on their own as they wanted. They acquired vaccine from the WHO representative in, in Kathmandu. Um, so all they needed was the vaccine, which, um, which allowed them then, which was delivered into the area, and they were able to start vaccinating. So that's the Everest example, and I'll come back to its significance later. The second area where we know something about where we have foreigners involved is the Lamjung district in central Nepal. Now the involvement here was quite different. Don Messerschmidt and Bruce Morrison worked through the district panchayat, the local authority. Their contribution, however, is absent even from Peace Corps history of its involvement with the eradication program. They were not health volunteers, but as in the Everest area, local people asked them for help. And at this time in Nepal, there's a very limited supply of vaccine. So in their Christmas break, December 1963, they went down to Kathmandu. They went to their Peace Corps director, who took them to Dr. Edward Crippen at USAID, who took them to the government's director of health services, Dr. Baidya, who agreed to give them some vaccine. 
They then went back to Lamjon and began vaccinating, but it was clear they didn't have enough and so sought more. Receiving no reply, Morrison walked. There was no road for several days to Kathmandu where he obtained some vaccine and the promise of more. And during early 1964, they gave or organized nearly 23,000 vaccinations in the villages of the district. And we need to remember there were really no health services in these areas at the time. Linking these two accounts is the situation in the capital Kathmandu. When Crippen arrived in February 1963, smallpox was present in the capital. Um, he was to be head of USAID health activity in Nepal. And he wrote how he saw cases of smallpox in the streets. Cases and deaths in Kathmandu Valley were being reported in the International Weekly Epidemiological Record. Numbers were later revised downwards, but I think much likely to be higher. In November, the epidemic peaked. The Minister of Health asked Crippen if the US would supply American freeze-dried vaccine. Crippen approached the USA director, who said no, but Crippen managed to get wire pharmaceuticals in the US to donate, and so USAID agreed to support. Crippen later secured further freeze-dried vaccine. This greatly increased the amount of vaccine available in Nepal, which did not produce its own vaccine. It never did. Some of that vaccine went to, Yang, to Lamjung. The highest number of cases was reported in the town of Timi in the pilot project area. But the vaccination program had been concentrating on the main towns in the valley and so had not reached Timi yet. The director of health services set to sent Dr. Ram Bhadra Adiga to head the government response. And a paper he later wrote provides a very rare glimpse into Nepalese responses. But limited time today does not allow me to go into this. The epidemic was brought under control and pilot project staff continued their vaccination program. No WHO staff were present at the time of the epidemic. So that leads me now on to WHO project Nepal 9, smallpox control pilot project. Cooperation um, and involvement with WHO through its Southeast Asia regional office offered a strategy for Nepal with its limited resources <coughs> towards achieving its own goals for better health services, which were, as I've mentioned, very limited at this time. In 1969, the CIRO's proposed program of estimate, the budgetary estimates for 1961 include support for a smallpox control pilot project. In August 1961, a plan of operations for a three-year project to start early in 1962 is signed. Um, this is to take place in the Kathmandu Valley. Now the project um, was going to be located in the Department of Health Services, but was separate from the government's immunization services. And importantly, there were refrigerators for vaccine storage. I'll come back to this point in the, in, in the conclusion. And as I said, the pilot reportedly used freeze-dried vaccine. And there's some debate around exactly when this came, but the reports all say freeze-dried vaccine. The project would last for three years and had two aims. To build, quote, a nucleus of smallpox vaccination activities in the three municipalities of Kathmandu Valley. And then, of, quote, of expanding the smallpox control campaign as and when possible to other areas. This was the most populous um, part of the country. Now, this plan clearly indicates that the intention was that the pilot would be the basis for future activities. So whatever was thought of, it was going to be the basis. It's not going to be something new. Now the first task was actually getting started. Now it sounds probably obvious to make that point, but not in Nepal. Outsiders constantly underestimated the lack of everything and overestimated targets which were then not met. Annual zero visits were made 
uh, and many issues identified. But the key message that came out each time was dissatisfaction that despite the overall large number of vaccinations and revaccinations in relation to the population, the number of vaccinations per vaccinator per day was poor. Immunological coverage was too low to achieve control. In 1964 visit, WHO medical officer Dr. Vishnayakov learned from the Director of Health Services that plans were already underway to extend the program to start in mid-1965. The Nepalese government were taking the initiative, not zero. Vishnayakov also wrote the evaluation report. There were positives, such as having sufficient and appropriate vaccine, and the vaccinators' techniques were good. But other messages regarding the level of immunity remained the same. Smallpox in three years had not been controlled in this pilot um, project area. So what next? Um, in August 1966, um, Dr. David Yaram visited the CIRO to draw up a plan for eradication. And the general principles were to be countrywide eradication of smallpox, the division of the country into seven areas, each with two zones, and separating the activities in line with language of the intensified worldwide program into three phases, preparatory, attack, maintenance. He allowed for the, quote, slow development of supporting health services throughout the country. Now previously entitled the Smallpox Control Pilot Project, the revised plan of operation was for smallpox eradication and control of other communicable disease in Nepal. So note the title was not just about smallpox. Um, it was signed by the government and WHO in November, superseding the previous pilot project and its addendum. Now before I, want, I conclude, I want to finish with mentioning a 1965 vaccination initiative that Yaram was aware of, the locally initiated and organized eradication program for two districts in the Kosi zone down in Terai near India. Now importantly, the vaccinator rates in this project achieved were much higher than the pilot project. It had wide community support, district medical staff worked with the panchayat and used people locally trusted as vaccinators. And it organized their training and payment. So it showed that it was possible to do. So what can we conclude from these early years before the intensified program? So first of all, smallpox could spread into the mountains, despite what the official um, history um, suggests. We already have um, an all, a global, and I put that in quotes, because what does global mean? World of smallpox in Nepal in the early 1960s. WHO was a part of that, but we have Americans, New Zealanders, um, and, and various sort of others all involved in different ways. We have, with those initiatives in the Everest area and Lamjung areas, we have locally valued, but the limited impact of foreigners. One foreigner in the mountains and valleys of Nepal cannot do very much. So a top-down program bringing in outside experts is not going to work. Um, the Nepalese, right from the start, have a desire for freeze-dried they knew it was better suited to their conditions, and that was what was used during the pilot. Very different views about the pilot. Pilot was in fact the largest communicable disease program then in Nepal, despite its low coverage. So it's not surprising the government had a different view of it from WHO. But as I just mentioned, another local initiative in 1965 showed how it could be much better. Now, there were many challenges. And this is what these early years highlighted. 
And as I said at the beginning, if I started to introduce Nepal and its challenges at the beginning, we'd never really sort of get anywhere. They just seemed o overwhelming. But what these early initiatives and things show is that, yes, it highlighted challenges, but it also offered ways forward and around them, and the later success was built on these. Now, a photo in the official history has a caption about difficult roads. I think a more accurate caption would reflect that Nepal had <coughs> almost no roads, and most of the population could not be reached with a vehicle or even a bike. You were going to have to walk. So Morrison walked to Kathmandu, but not only because there was no road, but also because for a phone call to get through from where he was, from where they were in to Kathmandu, was going to require going through 14 different operators. So messages were just weren't going to get through. You can't do the reporting, the surveillance and things without with these kinds of limited um, infrastructure. Throughout the whole campaign, vaccine storage was an issue because of the lack of refrigeration throughout most of the country. There just was no, there were no refrigerators. So all these basic things, and this is why I say outsiders keep overestimating what they could do and underestimating what the situation was um, in, in Nepal. The vaccination came to be preferred in the winter months, partly because in the summer, the monsoon, in the summer monsoon, the rivers, the many rivers that divided the country, um, flooded and prevented access. You could not get to different parts of the, the country. So success was going to have to come, so either overcoming or going around these challenges. It was going to have to be a program coming from below. And this is why um, these early years are so important. Nepal eradicated smallpox despite these challenges because the Nepalese and Ciro learned to work around or overcome them. And so as I say, this is why these early years are so important. Finally, um, I'd like to thank the many people who, in Nepal and elsewhere who are helping me to make Nepal's story visible. That whole Everest area epidemic is just, it's not there, but um, there are records we are piecing together a lot of that, um, a lot of that story. And it was not known at the time of the later, um, the later program. So thank you, if Don and Bruce are in any way listening, and also to Professor Hamang Dixit for his help with the Morang and Sansari um, District Initiative. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Carlos Campani, and as Sanja introduced me, I'm a Brazilian physician. And I'm going to talk about the creation and expansion of the Brazilian program to eradicate smallpox. Uh, I will run this presentation in a timeline format. So I will tell the history of smallpox in Brazil. And of course, that I will focus on the 50s and early 60s to understand how Brazil was able to eradicate this, the disease in 1971, we had the last case. So, uh, many, not to say most of books that tell us the story of smallpox eradication will tell us a story that began in 1967 onwards, when the so-called the intensified phase began. But I would say that, especially from a public health perspective, if, you, if you, we rely on these accounts, we must have a quite simplistic, rather narrow narrative. And we must risk to lose, to ignore two main important facts. The first of them, of this would be 
how a disease that was not at, in many countries, and Brazil was one of them, that was not a health priority, how this disease accomplished to have so much political support, so much political commitment, and consequently financial resource to be invested and eventually eradicated. We would lose the, the, this path, the process, and also, in most relevantly maybe, we would lose also the perspective of how the scientific evidence about the methodology, about the tools, the strategies required to eradicate smallpox was constructed to support the decision in 1966 when countries decided to sponsor the worldwide, the worldwide program. So I hope that at the end of this presentation, at least in Brazil, this will be made clear. So in the beginning, the smallpox was introduced in Brazil in the 16th century by the Portuguese colonizers and the vaccine was introduced in 1804. The pattern during the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century was an outbreak, especially in the, in the big urban centers in the ports of Rio de Janeiro and Salvador in Bahia, an outbreak every three to six years. And that was important because it disrupted the commerce. Following a pattern in Europe and North America, every disease that disrupted international commerce was a priority for public health. So, smallpox was a priority in Brazil in the first decade of the 20th century. And the evidence... Oh, well, sorry. The evidence for that, that's an out. Yes. I'm, I'm afraid that if I end the session, everything will hold up. That's okay. Yes. Yes. yes? Oh, okay, yes. Okay, no worries. So, in 1900, uh, the Foundation of Federal Serum Therapeutic Institute in Rio de Janeiro started to produce the smallpox vaccine in Brazil, uh, which is now recognized now as the uh, Osvaldo Cruz Institute. And uh, law, laws was, were made to uh, make vaccination an obligation. So compulsory vaccination was instituted to guarantee that the whole population were was uh, vaccinated and the, the, the disease was get into control. Uh, curiosity, this led to the most recognized uh, organized hesitance movement against vaccination in Brazil in 1904, which was called the Vaccine Revolt. But actually the vaccine case here was only the last drop in the ocean. Uh, many different sectors in the Brazilian society were uh, complaining about different uh, uh, subjects as the monarchists wanted uh, the king to return, the republicans were complaining about uh, low salaries and the obligation to get vaccinated was the reason to, uh, uh, to gather all, all the, the revolters and uh, the vaccine revolt happened. But in the first decade decades through health education programs, sanitation reform, this hesitance was uh, actually uh, reduced to uh, an end and the, the, the population supported the, the efforts to, to mass vaccination campaigns in Brazil and the, 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 the consequences that the, the disease was getting into under control uh, in the first decade. So that led into the, to the next during the first half of the 20th century, smallpox gradually lost importance in Brazil. Uh, probably mainly because of two reasons. First of all, the disease was not a priority anymore. Other diseases like malaria, yellow fever were in the 
the one in the top positions in the rank of public health to public health institutions in Brazil. Uh, and the work of the Rockefeller Foundation in Brazil uh, contributed to smallpox lose importance and malaria and yellow fever gain importance. But also what we call the epidemiological change play an important role. Uh, before the 20s and 30s, the main form of the disease was the varula major, which had a mortality rate around 20 to 30 percent. But after 1930s, the varula minor was the predominant uh, kind, uh, type of the disease which, as the name says, it's a, a, a minor disease, a really mild disease. One or two days of uh, a low fever, we had, you, you have a rash, but most importantly, workers were able to go to work and children were able to, 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 to continue to go to school. Uh, because it was a mild disease, and this led as the Brazilian historian Gilberto Hockman uh, claimed, this, this led to a kind of a social coexistence where not only the society but the politicians accepted the disease as a minor children disease and not a priority anymore, not something that we should be worried about. And following that, that we have two evidence for this uh, uh, lose of importance. In 1920, when the first National Department of Public Health was instituted, many diseases caught a specific department, sub-department, smallpox, don't. And the control was responsible, the responsibility was uh, changed to, from the federal government to small local agencies. And during the 30s and the 50s, this attitude didn't change. We, we experienced many uh, changes in, in, in the kind of in the type of governments in Brazil, but the attitude was the same. One proof is that in 1952, in an official National Service of Health Education smallpox campaign, the, the government blamed the population for the sporadic outbreaks because the vaccine was available. It was a compuls It was compulsory, but still people didn't vaccinate because they didn't want. The problem here is that the service was, uh, that existed, existed only in the urban centers. So the people lived in the rural areas didn't have access to vaccination. And at that time, at that time most of the Brazilian population lived in the rural area. Uh, so now I, I, I'll give a break in Brazil. I'm going to take a look at the continent, a continental perspective, because it's important to understand what happened, in the, the, especially in South America, to understand uh, some decisions that the Brazilian government made later. So, in fact, in 1950, uh, it, uh, the, the, the PAHO, the Pan American Health Organization, which is the regional office uh, for WHO, launched uh, a smallpox, a continental smallpox eradication program. Not too much uh, resources for that, not too much support, mainly based on uh, 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 stimulating countries to start to produce the freeze, the new freeze-dried uh, high-quality vaccine. Uh, and the national government was still responsible to, to, to carry on the, the program and the, and, and the mass vaccination campaigns. Ecuador was a successful case. It, it started their the, the, the program in 1958 and they were one of those countries that during the first phase from 1958 to 66, they, they, it was uh, uh, able to successfully eradicate uh, smallpox. But some lessons were learned in other countries. Colombia was an interesting case. They started the program in 1955, but actually, after five years, vaccinating more than 90, more than 80 percent, roughly 90 percent of the population, they still have cases because they let pockets of people unvaccinated, susceptible uh, uh, population, and that was enough 
for the smallpox virus to circulate in Colombia and still Colombia still had uh, uh, cases of smallpox even after a reasonably well carried on program. Peru and Bolivia also uh, highlighted the importance of a maintenance, maintenance phase. Both started a project Peru in 50, 1915, Bolivia in 1958, and they were able to eliminate the circulation of the virus initially in their countries, but without a maintenance uh, phase, uh, populations, especially newborns, high immigrants, they started to accumulate and pockets of susceptible uh, people uh, accumulated and cases were uh, not, uh, already uh, uh, actually uh, restarted in these countries, especially being imported from Brazil. And Venezuela, Paraguay, and Argentina, although they were not successful, uh, successfully eradicated smallpox, but they gave Pajo a great and important message. Virus don't respect political borders. They don't need a passport. So the virus uh, came from Brazil and constantly infected people in Argentina, Venezuela, in the borders. So that was an important tip for the Pan American Health Organization when 1965 to 1967, when a new program started in the American continent with all countries abroad, every country signing an agreement because it was not only Brazil the problem because the virus could be imported at any time. So every, all the countries needed to be vaccinated, the people at the same time. Uh, so I, I just said that in 1950, the PAHO launched a, a continental program and 1958, the WHO launched a worldwide program. And how the Brazilian government re responded to both proposals? Well, quite, dif quite differently in reality. In for the 1950 program for the PAHO, nothing actually happened. Brazil government maintained the inertia Control of the, the vaccination programs is still decentralized in small local agencies. Uh, one, one good evidence was the 1956 JK speech, JK is our JK, Juscelino Kubitschek, important Brazilian president, that he, he claimed that mass disease must be prioritized. And what he, did he meant by mass disease, tuberculosis, malaria, not smallpox. Although government was neglecting the disease, uh, Brazil was not with their arms crossed at all. Uh, some specialists, for example, some specialists went to the, to the continental send down smallpox vaccine in Peru in 1956 also. But 58 was different. Uh, JK accepted the proposal made by the Soviets and for the first time in the 19th century, in the, sorry, in the 20th century, smallpox was mentioned by a Brazilian president on a speech and he claimed that smallpox was eradicable and new official health policies start. First of all, he accepted WHO and PAHO assistance, especially regarding the quality and production of the Brazilian vaccine, and it started, it changed the, 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 the hierarchy and how the, the, the mass vaccination and vaccination on smallpox was carried out. He took the power from local small agents and centralized the decisions, the decisions into the federal government. Uh, what we call, so, but does that mean that Brazil started in 1958 a program to eradicate smallpox? The, the answer is no. Brazil lacked the resources needed, especially the vaccine, a high quality freeze dried freeze vaccine. Brazil lacked also a cadre of public health officials specialized in, in smallpox. Smallpox was neglected for a long time. Most public health officials from Brazil, they were worried about malaria and yellow fever, 
and we lack, of course, the structure, the basic health, stru health structure uh, to, to, to promote mass vaccination in the entire population. So, all the steps during 58 to 61 were focused on vaccine to produce public health officials exp experienced in, in the disease and to strengthen the basic health uh, 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 system. 19, one proved 1959, for the first time in many years in the Brazilian Congress of Hygiene, public health officials started to discuss, to talk about smallpox, and uh, claiming that it was a eradicable disease. One of, well, of the, 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 the officials uh, said one, one phrase that became uh, famous at the time, that each country suffers from the smallpox it deserves. He was criticizing the negligence they ignored uh, how the Brazilian governments ignored the disease in the last decades. And one turning point was in 1961 in the charter of Punta del West uh, in, in Uruguay. Um, parts of the Alliance for Progress movement in the American continent that Brazil officially started a policy uh, claiming that if a disease is eradic eradicable, the government will make all the, 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 the efforts necessary to eradicate this, this disease. He was uh, referring to malaria and smallpox. So during this, this time, although it lacked all the resources, uh, small pilot projects, especially in rural areas and in the borders, were, was, were introduced, started. Um, but it's, it's important to, to understand that during this, this period, only glycerinated vaccine was used in Brazil. And at that time, population in Brazil was around 75 million people, so the number of people vaccinated was really small, but it was a start to understand the best process to, 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 to start mass vaccination campaigns. So, with the political support, now uh, uh, with the freeze-dried dried vaccine being started being produced, in the few occurs in Rio de Janeiro. So in January 1962, the government started, launched the, the first program specifically targeting smallpox, was the national campaign against smallpox. Notice that there was not control or eradication uh, in, in the title of the program. And many Brazilian historians also, they claim that this program was not a program to eradicate smallpox, was, was more related to smallpox control. But if you look at the goal uh, for the government, they aim to vaccinate 80% of the population in five years. And at that time, that was exactly what WHO was saying to the countries. If you do that, in five years you vaccinate 80% of your population, you will eradicate smallpox. So I would argue that this problem was indeed made to eradicate smallpox. Uh, however, the responsible for the problem was not someone specialized in smallpox, because we didn't have at the time. It was coordinated by the National Service of Health Education and the program was decentralized. Actually, the federal government only provided the vaccine, the responsibility to organize and, and run, carry out all the mass vaccination campaigns was in the states, 26 different states in Brazil. Um, so, as 26 different programs in one major program, a lot of heterogeneity uh, actually uh, uh, happened. Some, some places uh, worked with fixed posts, other, play, other places, other states with the methodology of house by house, with mobile teams, so lots of heterogeneity and two big problems. One, the program was heavily underfunded. It started in January 62, but in the second semester of 62 and in the first semester of 63, no funds at all. So none, no one was vaccinated. So lots of difficulties with, with funding. And most importantly, Brazil experienced at that time lots of political instability. 
many chains in commands. So, the, 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 in, in, in fact, the problem was not successful. And because of this frequent political instability, in 1964, a military coup deposed the elected government. It's not my, uh, uh, my aim here, my purpose, to talk about why it happened, uh, but in fact, the result of the military coup was, it can, it can be assumed that it was beneficial for the problem because of three points. The first, as every dictatorial power, it centralized uh, responsibility. So it took responsibility from the states and everything now, from now on, would be decided in the federal uh, uh, sphere. sphere. So, and this, at, at that time, when Brazil didn't, uh, didn't have a strong basic health system structure, it was the ideal scenario for an uh, education program. And now, so the government sought for international and national legitimacy. And how did they do that? Internationally, they started to work closely with international organizations, especially WHO and PARO. And nationally, they, they sought for programs that could have an impact nationally and they could differentiate them from the older regime. So they saw, they saw in the smallpox eradication a good opportunity to ally themselves with international organizations and with the people from Brazil seeking legitimation for the, 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 the military cop. Uh, as they were started to work closely with international organizations and especially with the United States, in January 1965, I would say the watershed uh, process happened in Brazil which was the value of scientific evidence uh, that started to put smallpox eradication in something really tangible, something that could happen. Two main problems in Brazil at that time. First, what was the, 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 the methodology to carry on mass vaccination campaigns? It, it was basically responsibility from the states, lots of heterogeneity, so it was a question to be answered. And second of all, and probably most important, funds. Brazil was not a rich country at that time, so the program needed to be cheaper. And this, this, uh, this piece of work uh, was really welcome at that time and supported, guarantee, I would say even guarantee the political support that a program uh, like smallpox education needed. So, the, 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 the research uh, compare two different strategies, one using, using jet injectors, the other one using multipuncture technique, house by house, the jet injector in a fixed vaccination post. And the results, the results show that the first uh, 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 jet injector in a fixed vaccination post was much more efficient than the second. And most importantly, the cost for those was seven times lower than the former strategy that the government was using. So this was a new strategy for Brazil. It showed a faster and a cheaper way to progress with vaccination and eventually eradication. Just to summarize the, the former program, so 20, Roughly 24 million vaccinations in the Brazilian population, which accounted for 19 million, around 66. So you can see that uh, the best, in, in the best case, around roughly 40% of the population in the northeast and the southeast region were vaccinated. The negative aspects, I, I already talked about it, it was decentralized, many chains in command, lots of political instability, and Basically, most importantly, lack of proper food, but it also had specific positive aspects. The first of it, it set an anti-smallpox drive, not only in the population that started to, to want to get vaccinated, but they formed public health officials experienced in smallpox young public health officials that started their career working on smallpox and this is really important in countries like Brazil. 
and most importantly, the political support that uh, 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 was accomplished, especially with the scientific evidence that I showed before. That led to, in November 65, the, government, the, the military government wanted to break uh, uh, any chains with the former program. So in 1955, 65, sorry, a written agreement was signed between Pablo and Brazil. As I said, every South American country signed a, 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 a written agreement to eradicate smallpox with Pablo. And I look at every agreement and all country, in every country, the main purpose to, 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 to launch the smallpox eradication program was because of the disease that struck the population. The Brazilian agreement, although the Brazil was the most important uh, country in the, in the region, having cases of the smallpox and eventually exporting the, the virus, in the Brazilian agreement, it was all about Brazil being an international threat. It was like the Brazilian government was saying, okay, so to do what your countries, all, every country want, I will start a smallpox eradication program in Brazil. That was something that the government wanted, international legitimacy. So that, well, that's why I'm claiming that for the, the, for, for the smallpox eradication uh, program, the military cup was uh, advanced the purpose of uh, uh, the, this program. Uh, so basically, the program started in 1966. The characteristics was centralized. Now the program was run by the, the, the health ministry, Brazilian health ministry. Go to vaccinate, to vaccinate 90% of the population, and the, the strategy was based on mass vaccination campaigns using the jet injectors. Uh, the whole. The whole uh, program was planned and organized by Brazilian public health officials and the government. I would say that WHO and PAO was partial blind about what was going on in Brazil. And we had a, 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 a series of letters exchanged in 65 and 66, weeks before the launch of the program, from uh, letters exchanged. Uh, between PAHO officials and WHO uh, officials in Geneva. They were surprised what was going on in Brazil. They didn't know who was, in, who was the chief of the program. And once the city official in Geneva eventually claimed that we, WHO and PAHO should start to support individual states in Brazil to accomplish uh, eradication. And that was when one of the PAHO officials in Washington, they said they understand how the Brazilian system works, how the federative uh, uh, pact works, and they say, no, this, this can't be done. Brazil is different uh, uh, than other countries like Pakistan. When did this, this, this strategy happened in the past, not regarding smallpox, other disease, but also it's, uh, it happened in the past. So, but in Brazil, it can't be done. Every contact must be done with Brasilia, with the central government. So when WHO officials joined, three officials joined the program, the program already started in 67. And the role of WHO was basically technical advisory support and funding, especially donating uh, cars for mobile teams uh, and uh, the jet injector. Just to conclude, uh, I, I always, when I, when I study smallpox eradication program, I always like to, to think about uh, a comparison to marriage. Uh, when, we, when you ask about how long have you been married, every one of us will say from the date that we say, we said yes. But I would argue that that's wrong. We should not do that anymore. Because a marriage, a relationship, start when you first start to date your boyfriend or your girlfriend. The whole history before you get married is important for your, your relationship. And as that, like that, when we study the smallpox eradication program, we can't just analyze what happened from 6 to 7 on. Because when we do that, we lose all the story about how political support, and, and I just said that in Brazil, 
It was really different than other countries. Every country, every nation had that particularity. So we knew that, how that happened, and we knew how the evidence was constructed, built on the ground to support the decisions, the political decision to invest, to sponsor the program. So the main points that I would like to, to highlight to, to end, the set of an anti-smallpox strike was extremely important during this first phase in the 50s and the early 60s. Uh, national particularities must be kept in mind when we analyze each country is different. Uh, development in fields is extremely important. Research and development was fundamental to accomplish the support that was necessary and also strengthening the basic health services and the, the main legacy that led to Brazil in, 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 in especially in the vaccination program and in surveillance also. I think that would be all. Thank you. and the University of York, whose support has made my fellowship experience truly incredible. I'm grateful to the Commonwealth Trust for the award and my employers in Mumbai who enabled me so that I could avail this fellowship. Finally, I thank my co-panelists, Sue, Lou, and Carlos for discussions that preceded this panel today and hopefully will follow much after we close. So I have for here I have for you here the words of two famous participants in the worldwide program as well as the Indian program. I quote after the nineteen sixty six World Health Assembly voted to create a global smallpox eradication program, India did not immediately set up a WHO-assisted campaign, as nearly all the other 34 countries had done. But in that year, India did make a substantial contribution to world smallpox. It was a very big number in that year. Still, India counted on its large army of trained health workers and the st state NSAP programs to break the back of smallpox without external assistance. We have Henderson who says, the government insisted that national staff, now with more than five years experience, could learn nothing from the WH advisors. WH advisors were not allowed to move out of the country without permission from the government as well, though they were demanding to help and claiming to help. Both these participants have written extensively about India, and here in their personal memoirs, they sound clearly exasperated by Indian arrogance. In 1967, there were 85,000 recorded cases, the highest in a decade. So from 57 to 67, this was a very high number, and this was about 35% of the world's smallpox. It was well after India had officially begun its global program in 1962. The government was far from achieving its ambition of smallpox eradication, and this has been declared in several reports since. But as we all know, India did eventually did er uh, eradicate smallpox, and that indeed is a remarkable story, but not the subject of my talk today. I will be commenting on the decade of the 1960s, Paraphrasing the historian Paul Greenu, who has written about certain aspects of the Indian program, I believe there are enough reasons 
for stirring up the embers of the early Indian eradication program. So I'm going to outline key features of the national program, particularly commenting on the background, the mass vaccination strategy that was adopted, and explain how the Indian experience became central to the early evolution of global strategy. In the course of this talk, it will become evident that the global program itself was rapidly shifting strategy and drawing on experiences from the field. I will close with an illustration of the importance of recognizing local attitudes, which is the overall theme of our panel today. This I will show through the Indian response to the introduction of the bifurcated needle, which itself was presented as a panacea to the problem of technique, speed, and optimization of vaccine use, usage. I'm sorry. And then I will make a few observations. Just to set the context, uh, India has a large number of religious communities, majority of them Hindus, for whom smallpox was seen as a visitation by the goddess. Sheetala, the cool one, or the mild one, the gentle one, commonly referred to as Mada, Mata, which means mother, in the belief that this goddess has the power to cool the fever of smallpox and to prevent, from, prevent it from becoming fatal and killing, uh, especially children. Sheetala is worshipped in large parts of northern India, western India, and eastern India. But in western India, she is not exclusively associated with smallpox. Uh, she has other functions as well. In South India, we have the deity Mariamman. So smallpox could result from the wrath of the goddess if you had displeased her in some way. But it, there was another explanation. It could also be a result of an imbalance of heat and cold, which comes from traditional Ayurvedic understanding of the body system, but also in folk medicine. Now this assumes importance because traditional ideas about the causation, prevention, and treatment of the disease reflect cultural and metaphysical setting in which the disease appeared and also provides the backdrop against which the eradication program unfolded. The World Health issue declaring the eradication of smallpox in May 1980, for example, had an important article saying the goddess defied, which was obviously referring to the Indian goddess of smallpox who was defied and uh, smallpox was eradicated. So um, this is quite uh, interesting. So what's the background of the disease in India? It's called Chechak in most medical texts. And this was the word that was used uh, by public health workers, though usually people would say that they were visited by the goddess, Mata Ana, and which is what even I have heard and used for both chicken pox and smallpox. So interestingly, chicken pox was usually called as Choti Mata, which means the smaller goddess and uh, smallpox because it was more fatal, it was called as Badi Mata. India is an endemic region. It's home to variola major, a deadly form which kills about 30% of those affected and maims and blinds most people who are affected by it. If you survive, then you survive for life. There was this uh, anecdotal stories that when people were married off, they would look for grooms who had pock marks so that you know that this person is not going to die and you're not going to be widowed. So Indians traditionally practice variolation, a characteristic which was shared with the Chinese, though the practice has eroded uh, due to prohibit prohibitory legislation over, over time. I'm sorry. India has had epidemics every five years. It is seasonal. It peaks between December and May, and therefore the heat, which is, uh, uh, and subsides during monsoons. The virus is quite contagious, though various studies have pointed out that the most likely source of infection is contact with the patient in the early phase of the disease and may primarily through direct droplet transmission. Along with plague and cholera, smallpox cases were recorded in colonial public health reports through the 20th century. The major epidemic years in independent India were 51, 58, 63, 67 and 1974. So it comes in these four or five year cycles. 
the few indigenous cases that were seen in 1975, and finally India was proclaimed a non-endemic country on 5th July 1975. A few words about health planning in India. In the 1960s, uh, we had a population of about 400 million people, 16 states, now we have 29. Now it's in important because each state had its own health ministry and related departments and officials. So though there was a central ministry uh, and international agreements, etc., were uh, negotiated at the central level, actual implementation of policy happened at the various states level. And so therefore you see for every uh, national program that was implemented, unless and until it was centrally sponsored, there was a considerable amount of variation in the program. Uh, why was the National Smallpox Eradication Program launched? There was a massive outbreak of cholera and smallpox in 1958. An expert committee of the Indian Council of Medical Research was set up in 1959. Pilot district, pilot project, I'm sorry, in one district of each state and in Delhi were conducted to ascertain the problems on the field and an important discovery apart from administrative bottlenecks, which are to be assumed, was the faulty technique and inadequate training of vaccinators. So a special note on instruction for vaccinators was prepared, standardizing the technique, standardizing the number of insertions, how the vaccine was to be given and circulated. But as we will see, standardization remained an exception rather than the norm. These pilots had used liquid vaccine produced in India except one state, Orissa, which had got freeze-dried vaccine from Netherlands. Though the NSCP was finally launched with freeze-dried vaccine donated by the Soviet Union, and Professor Sanjay Bhattacharya has shown the complex negotiations that preceded this switch, even to uh, begin with a liquid vaccine. What was the strategy? The essence of the strategy called for a specially recruited team to move systematically from house to house and from village to village throughout a district in an effort to vaccinate or revaccinate not less than 80% of the population. With this proportion vaccinated, it was expected that a sufficient number of persons would be immune so that smallpox transmission would terminate spontaneously. So this was the magical 80%. The vaccination team was preceded by enumerators who listed in a large multi-page register the name of each person along with his age, address, as well as previous history of vaccination or smallpox. One register was compiled for each village or defined area in a city and was intended to be used for the next 20 years. So this register had larger public health functions as well. After enumeration had been completed, the register was given to the vaccination team which then endeavored to vaccinate all those people who were listed. This register was then given to an inspector who was to check each vaccinee to ensure that the vaccination had been successful. Because as most of you would know, simply giving a vaccine doesn't mean that it has, I mean, that it's a take. It may have not really uh, produced the necessary reaction. Subsequently, local health unit vaccinators, there, were, there was one for every 50 to 70,000 persons were assigned the responsibility to vaccinate those missed out in the mass campaign and which was called mopping up. And I kept seeing this word mop, mopping up several times and I kept wondering what is this mopping up that is being referred to. And this mopping up campaign was essential because it would be people who, 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 who just were not found when somebody went and knocked on their doors. It could be mobile population, it could be people who were not with a permanent residential address living on the streets and so on and so forth. So finally this was, mopping up was also important and finally there was this injunction to revaccinate everyone every five years and vaccinate contacts when smallpox was discovered. Health education was an important part of the program and enumerators were also uh, expected to talk about the importance of vaccination, considering the traditional beliefs about the disease and the fact that the disease itself was seen as a visitation by the goddess. So why would you want to vaccinate and not welcome the goddess? Uh, now, a very important observation that was made in the pilots was that 
the resistance was not due to religious beliefs. An important observation was made that it was the faulty technique and the use of a contraction which is unique to India, and you'll hear more about this later, which was called Rotary Lancet. Uh, as for standard practice, 80% of all sections of the population were to be vaccinated and after three years, the maintenance phase would begin in March 1965 when it was hoped that the NSEP would be absorbed into the local health sector network. So, as you can see, uh, these vaccinators were trained, they were trained for about six weeks and each one had to vaccinate about 100 you know, had to have 100 vaccinations every day. This was a centrally aided program with a considerable amount of uh, investment by the central government. What is very interesting is that all of this was achieved without any legislation. So if you look at the records, a lot of stress is paid by the people actually on the field asking, clamoring for legislation, but the government always desisted. They never, uh, you know, brought out a uh, you know, uh, uh, compulsory legislation. There was some variation, there were some states which had legislation, but in any case, it was not ever enforced. <laughs> so this is very interesting and a very unique aspect of the program. There was an important outbreak in Delhi in the winter of 1963, and this was while the campaign was on. So there was a major outbreak and everybody was taken aback. Why is there an outbreak when the campaign is on and people are claiming that 80% vaccination has been achieved? Following this, there was an independent assessment done. And following this independent assessment, there were independent assessments done in various other districts. And a manual was created where people who were vaccinating could also do assessment and evaluation. And there was what was an important finding out of this, it was realized that there was a discrepancy between recorded vaccinations and actually immunized people. And thus, the target was now changed from 80% to 100% mass vaccination. Now, uh, the director of the NSEP, Dr. Lal, made a presentation of his findings before the first expert committee on smallpox that met in Geneva. So, this one. So, Lan makes all the presentations of all these assessments that he has done in this expert committee. The report sets a target, it's very important to know this, the report sets a target, and this is this uh, expert committee, which sets a target of covering 100% of the population in the attack phase. In all probability, drawing from the Indian assessments, and this fact has also been recorded in the WHO official history, the big red book that all of us keep reading. Uh, though mass vaccination had been elaborated upon, in all fairness, this document also mentioned controlling the spread of outbreaks through ring vaccination, meaning if there's an outbreak, uh, you know, you vaccinate people around the person who has been affected and therefore you stop the transmission of the disease. The mention of family registers and laudatory references to independent appraisals of the program in different parts of India as a template for national control programs in other countries indicated the crucial role played by Indians in global experiments with designing similar programs. Concurrent evaluation in India, which means while the program is on, you're still evaluating it. This was specially singled out for praise and I've seen several notes, unpublished notes, uh, which, uh, which were published around 1964, which discuss this organization uh, and concurrent evaluation and commend India. Finally, the report in fact suggested re-christening the national level eradication programs as national smallpox control programs, arguing that the word eradication could be applied only if you, you, if you were conducting the program over a large area, see a continent or the whole world. And this brings me back to Carlos's point of this word control being used. So he is in fact arguing that though the word control was used, they were actually doing eradication because it was obviously 80% and he's right. But there was this distinction of nomenclature that was also proposed in this report. Nonetheless, by 1965, uh, all these program assessments, though fruitful, were also scathing 
and pointing out the deficiencies in the program. The focus on number of vaccinations elided the distinction between primary and revaccination, and groups such as school children were vaccinated several times over because they were easy to access, while infants were largely excluded. And this was a major drawback of the program. And finally, it was calculated that the overall vaccination coverage was around 63%, and it varied in various states. So in some states, it was less than 63, much less than 63, in some higher. So overall, it was 63. Uh, meanwhile, things were, as you can see, are escalating internationally. So I'll just go back to the assessment and, uh, yeah. So, so this is, so, uh, the, so the initial pilots, the 660-61, so the first projects were conducted in these districts in each state, and you know, these districts were chosen because they were inaccessible, difficult to, uh, difficult to go to, or remote, so they were, they were chosen for these reasons. Then in 63-64, these areas were assessed. And finally, and, and I'll come to this in a moment, these were the states, there were five, there were five independent evaluations, including Delhi, in 1967. As you can see what is happening around 1966, uh, the famous call is given, and thereafter, things escalate really fast. A flurry of, flurry of reports are published, technical documents are published, a new strategy, which is called surveillance containment, is also uh, referred to, and what we have then uh, is a new focus. And meanwhile, the Indian program was supposed to go into maintenance phase, but there were several epidemics. It's almost thrown out of gear. And this has an overall demoralizing effect on the people. Well, early evaluations, which were conducted in 63, had a handful of consultants. The 1967 joint evaluation had eight WHO staff or foreign staff of USAID and so on and so forth, and eight Indian staff. And finally, uh, at this point, India had to agree now to have more than merely technical assistance for the program. So this comes, brings us back to this anxiety that Henderson was expressing is, why is it India not accepting help? So, but in 70, there's a new agreement that is signed between WHO and India, and uh, the first staff uh, arise in 1971 and then begins a new phase of the program. What is usually forgotten is that 1966-67 was particularly harsh outbreak of famine in Bihar and you have heart-rending images of famine-stricken as well as small, smallpox-stricken children. There was a severe drought in India and uh, not to speak of the general con conditions of scarcity which were created uh, because of a war with Pakistan. So. Another thing, and uh, so in this period, however, the Global Smallpox Eradication Program is progressing with certain key publications and certain things being advocated, one of these being the bifurcated needle. So it was introduced in 1968, and this was the manual. Uh, it was made of stainless steel. It was only two inches or five centimeters long with a two-pronged fork at the end. And uh, though the technique was multiple pressure, uh, Henderson sort of modified it and made it into 15 punctures. What was the main advantage of this new contraption? The fact that it used less vaccine. So with one vial, you could now vaccinate 100 people instead of 25 that were being vaccinated. So this was like a four-fold saving of the vaccine. And that was one of the main reasons why it was being pushed. Uh, the other thing being the needle itself was quite cheap. You could get about 5,000, you could get it, a thousand needles in five dollars and this brought down the costs of vaccination considerably. Uh, so I'll just uh, uh, share with you uh, the various techniques uh, through history. Uh, L. L is the bifurcated needle. So you see how it uh, sort of this is and, and the other thing about the smallpox vaccination is it, it should be in the uh, it should not penetrate very deep into the layers of the skin. So this was very important and therefore most of these techniques sort of, so you had to strike a balance between not being too superficial and not penetrating too deep. This 
is the Rotary Lancet, which we will come to in a minute, and which was very popular in India. There is something which is called as a simple scratch, which is how you could just scratch. So there were different ways you could either put the vaccine and scratch the vaccine into your skin. Uh, so there were, there were different techniques. There was also this idea of how many insertions that you make. Do you just put one insertion? So that means do you give the vaccine only in one spot of the skin or do you give two insertions? And, and that would determine how potent the vaccine would be and how much of immunity would be created. Um, this is the Rotary Lancet, which was extremely popular in India. Uh, for reasons not fully explained, it was very popular. Uh, in fact, uh, there is a reference to something called as the Bombay model, which came up in 1935, and it was used in the Indian subcontinent, also in Pakistan, uh, and subject of much scorn and ridicule, again by both Henderson and Brilliant in their account. It caused painful arms, and most importantly, it wasted vaccine. But Henderson was not the only one who had tried to turn the Indian vaccinator away from its use. The assessments which were done, and I mentioned them in 1963, especially in Mysore and Palghat, indicated that the vaccination technique with Rotary Lancet and freeze-dried vaccine was causing painful arms, leading to resistance, and they pleaded with the authorities that new tests be conducted and move be made away from the Rotary Lancet to using a pin or a pointed nib with the multiple pressure technique or the linear scratch technique to reduce trauma. They urged conducting studies, but a circular was released in 1964 conveying that the smallpox workers conference had decided that the Rotary Lancet would continue. Why was that? Because it had been used for decades, and I quote, it was not considered advisable at present to change over to linear scratch method in the midst of the eradication campaign. But it was unanimously felt that the size of the Rotary Lancet be standardized, unquote. So the Rotary Lancet was not given up, and we understand it was primarily due to pressure from the actual vaccinators uh, who were on the field. So what happens when Henderson tries to introduce a bifurcated needle? There's always opposition again. Uh, this time, both from administrative and scientific leaders, there were questions of acceptance by the public whether, the, whether using the bifurcated needle would produce takes. And the concern was primarily because of the very small amount of vaccine that would go into the needle. So it would be a very small quantum and most of the vaccinators would say that why would this produce any kind of a take? So thus it was decided that the National Institute of Communicable Disease in India carry out a comparative study in Delhi using both the bifurcated needle as well as the conventional rotary lancet and decide whether the, the bifurcated needle was good enough. Uh, some of these studies were conducted and finally people were convinced to switch over though this was also not complete. I have given this example to show how the program did not develop with quick technical fixes. New technology perceived as superior and beneficial to project outputs was not simply transplanted in varied settings. There were local concerns and anxieties that had to be assuaged. Experiments were conducted by national authorities before they were accepted and even here, as is candidly admitted, rather reluctantly. Attitudes and habits were greatly resilient and people had to be persuaded through the mediation of local authorities and many a time even permitted to continue the old practice. Though the vaccination, though the bifurcated needle was introduced world over in 68, in India it was not used right into the 70s. This is important to emphasize the adjustments that the WHO and global efforts had to make so that programs functioned rather than simply broke down. And finally, I would like to conclude. Uh, the official SAP report acknowledges that following the national program, millions had been rendered immune through vaccination, and a decrease in the true incidence of the disease would have occurred, but probably there were also better notification, so you could not see the actual decrease uh, in incidence. There were other regional variations, the southern states were doing very well, health education benefits were 
many, but most importantly, as Sanjay Bhattacharya also points out in his book, that the vaccinators or people, manpower was trained and this eventually became important when the intensified program was launched. It is also admitted in a lot of private unpublished correspondence which I saw in the WHO archives. In many ways, mass vaccination was quite in line with the public health strategies of the time. In any case, the final verdict on surveillance containment for the final inch is also mixed. For instance, Nancy Steppen reminds us that it was not crucial for the program in Brazil or even in Upper Volta. So finally, if you look at the eradication saga only from the standpoint of WHO's global call of 1966, we are doing a great disservice to the modern smallpox story and erasing histories. Perhaps it is time to study national stories upwards rather than from the international level down. So since I had begun uh, with a quotation or words from an American, I go back to words of another American, Fred L. Soper, the arch er eradicationist, the big daddy of eradication, if you will. And what does he say in uh, the American Public Health Association meeting in 1965? He commends the Indian program for stopping smallpox entering Europe and America in 1963-65. And he also says that the program was on its path and if it continued, it would have led to success. Who knows? Thank you. this opportunity to thank uh, colleagues at York uh, University for facilitating my participation in today's seminar. Um, I have to say that um, until I met uh, Sanjoy and Joel a few weeks ago, I was not really conscious of and uh, aware of the importance of uh, the history of uh, uh, public health. And um, I must confess, I now have a newly found realization of uh, the importance of uh, that um, uh, history. You know, as I listened to the four excellent uh, presenters today, um, I now realize that um, perhaps there's been uh, a significant deficit or deficiency in the the teaching of either medicine or history in our part of the world. Um, I have to say that um, uh, both in the departments of uh, history and department of uh, uh, medicine, um, I don't recall uh, any concerted effort to teach um, uh, the history of uh, the public health. Um, so I'm hoping that um, this realization and the interaction that we had with uh, Sanjo and uh, Joel a few weeks ago will initiate um, some uh, uh, movement and uh, hopefully support from WHO uh, and um, other universities that are more advanced in this uh, area of study. Um, I listened to the history uh, of um, smallpox um, I have to confess that uh, I have not read the history of public health, but uh, um, the, the, the history of uh, small post eradication. But I can say that uh, in our part of the world, in Zimbabwe in particular, uh, there is um, uh, a chronology of uh, smallpox starting back in the 1920s, and uh, there were sporadic uh, epidemics 
uh, between that time in uh, 1928 until about 1968 when uh, uh, it was uh, declared eradicated in our part of uh, uh, the world. So my comment or my general concern uh, for to be in, uh, in today's um, uh, presentation or seminar, um, I would like to uh, request uh, and ask at the same time what um, might happen or what could happen to promote the um, documentation of um, public health uh, initiatives and public health happenings. I have uh, recently finished um, work on uh, the development of a community health strategy for Zimbabwe. Just looking at um, what's coming out of uh, that process, I see a situation where the involvement of communities, the inputs and um, the role of uh, communities uh, in eradication of uh, various <coughs> communicable diseases could easily go unnoticed, undocumented, and uh, I believe that um, this would be a serious uh, deficiency or oversight um, for the future. So my hope is that uh, with this realization, we will get um, some serious thinking, some serious actions taken to ensure that um, some of the goings on at the moment, especially um, the uh, history of uh, primary health care and the role that uh, communities are now playing in uh, eradication and just contribution to public health will be well documented and uh, for, the, for, for the future. So once again, I'd like to thank uh, your colleagues for involving me in this seminar today and uh, make a plea that uh, let this be the beginning of um, a rich process of uh, documentation of uh, the history of uh, public health. Thank you. Thank you, Godfrey. Um, the floor is open. Discussions, questions. Thank, thank you so much. We'd like to questions, comments. No. Thank you, everyone. My name is Ron Lunes from the Department of Politics here in New York. Thank you all for your excellent presentation. I think this is a fascinating. Uh, perspectives. Thank you also, Godfrey's still with us, right? Yeah. Uh, thank you also, Godfrey, for joining us. Thank you, Godfrey, for joining us, and I second your comments, and I hope that we can continue to uh, collaborate in documenting um, public health in Zimbabwe and other places, and focusing in particular, as you mentioned, on the role of communities and community health workers. Um, I had lots of questions, but I don't want to monopolize, so I'm just going to stick with, with a couple of uh, questions. Um, to uh, Sue, uh, I was very interested in something that you said at the end of your mm -hmm. presentation about that uh, medical association uh, initiative that happened in 1965, mm -hmm. if my memory yes. serves yes. me, and that in your view points towards what could be a successful or at least an effective uh, way to approach these sorts of programs. So if I understood correctly, this was uh, an initiative on the part of the, medical, the, the Nepal Medical Association. And I would, I, would like you, I would like to get some more details about this. Why did this initiative come up in 1965? Was it as a, re a reaction as to what was perceived as the inefficiency of the pilot that was being led by WHO? Was it in conjunction with the WHO efforts? How exactly did this initiative come about? And if you could give us some more details on that, that would be, that would be great. Yeah. And to Carlos, um, fascinating um, um, research. I think you've touched upon in your research and in this project a, a crucial tension and a crucial problem in the Brazilian public health system. Mm 
and I would dare say a crucial issue in the future of Brazilian democracy. What you hinted at in your, in your project, in, in your research, is a problem that the universal has, health system has, has, has gone through since its inception, the, the SUSE, the Brazilian uh, universal health system, which is the tension between the, the, the federal centralization and the need to decentralize in order to ensure a tailor-made or fine-tuned care to respond to diversity and heterogeneity in the territory. Now, what you suggest in your, in your presentation is that actually the centralized model, in the case of smallpox, worked better. Because the dictatorship was able to take up the reins and centralize and take autonomy away from the local agents, and this contributed to the effectiveness of the program. And we know that this, the universal health system in Brazil is being attacked, and is currently being attacked, because of its supposed inefficiencies. And part of the reason is that, that people say is that because of all of these localized and because of the, of the difficulties in implementing things in, uh, on the ground, we need to dismantle, further dismantle the Brazilian health system and open the way for privatization. So I think there's just something interesting here, I don't know if you've gone very far in reflecting about this, about the implications of decentralization versus decentralization debate. And at a time, and this is why it's important for Brazilian democracy, at a time when the current government is returning to the celebration of the, of the dictatorship and of the military coup, these kinds of arguments, if not taken into the historical perspective that you're given, can be actually a bit dangerous, right? And I, I'm sure you're aware of that. So I was wondering whether, I don't know if you've gone very far in reflecting, but I think there's potentially, if you haven't done so, there's potentially something very interesting here that you can make a, a fantastic contribution to debates about public health in Brazil and to debates about the future of Brazilian democracy. So well done, I think it's a fascinating research. So, so right. Well, the, the 1965 um, campaign is actually very interesting. I only recently um, discovered it because a colleague of mine in Nepal had very not read the autobiography of the really the sort of originator of the project and translated it. One day I had this email saying, I think you'll be interested in this. And this, because I had kept hearing about this project, but there are no, there are no records. Uh, but so I had these translated few, few pages. And it illustrates a lot about the context and environment of, in Nepal at the time, and I sort of mentioned uh, the, the very limited sort of health infrastructure that um, related that. The pilot was seen very much as this is what was happening in the Kathmandu Valley, the main uh, main area. That didn't stop other areas. Um, under, through the health department if they, if they wanted, or if more importantly, if they were able to initiate their own vaccination. Uh, so any smallpox vaccination was the responsibility of the district um, sort of health officer if they, if they had one. This area uh, happened to have also its own independent branch of the medical association. Uh, and how it really sort of started was that essentially this doctor decided, well, if, other, if the world, other countries can eradicate smallpox, why can't we? And so set up a scheme for um, started planning and meeting with people to organize this scheme for the children of their district. And the total population was about the same, I think something in the region of 400,000. So this was not sort of, this was not a small scheme. It's the same sort of population as the pilot project area. And so they started making links. But what was important about this, this was coming from within the community. So he was work, they, he and other personnel were working with the local authorities. They, um, they sorted out issues about payment, about training, things that were being raised as problems with the pilot, but this group, they, 
they were working out how to do it. They got the relevant people um, on, on board uh, to, to support them. But as I say, the key feature was and what was and what the zero um, uh, re, um, visit, field visit report picks up on used people that were trusted within the community. So used teachers, people with it, it's a, people like that, people who had some education. Um, and we need to think at this point, um, Lou talked about levels of illiteracy within in China. In Nepal, it's, mu it's even higher. So it, we're talking about maybe four or five percent literacy. So, uh, so what they tried to do was to get people like teachers who had at least some, some school, but we need to forget about people with high level training. I mean, but these were people who were trusted and this was why it offered a way forward because the later programs, the later program did build on this need for having people who were trusted in the community, who were well accepted. Because if you think about the environment of Nepal, which um, sort of 97% rural, this vast area, as I was saying, without the communication, without roads, without things, you were never going to get these teams going out. You had to work with the community setups that you'd actually got. You had to build up um, a group of people within the community. They didn't have to be health workers, health professionals, but the only way that they were going to achieve um, eradication of these was by, in, in this case, effective descent. It's not just decentralization from the top saying that you're going to have to set it up. You had, the actual implementation had to be decentralized. So you could still have your, in the end, what became your program in Kathmandu. But the only way it worked in all the different areas and how it was gradually expanded was where you had got these local structures, local support. So this, um, this district where this campaign was started was one of the early areas where it was expanded in, into um, because it was seen that there was um, that there was sort of support for it. But um, very much, Nepal, it, it has to be, um, if it's going to be implemented successfully, it has to be bottom up. Um, and the question throughout looking at the campaign is, keep asking, I, I, I say something like, well, this is the first nation nationwide campaign. Um, it, it was the first. Still the most astounding thing is, how on earth was that successful? It still amazes me that at the time that they did manage to eradicate smallpox because the challenges were so um, enormous. Um, and it was certainly only could be done um, with support of people. And I haven't talked about anything about, about people's and differing beliefs or acceptance of vaccination. There wasn't time to sort of do anything about that, but you had to have this, um, this wide throughout the country, people that could actually implement vaccination. So as I say, it didn't have to be health workers and different things. It had to be that widespread support um, for, for the program. John, you touched a, a very important point. Uh, I learned with, with Sandra Bhattacharya that we must analyze history with historical concepts, not with our contemporary mentality. So in the 50s and the 60s, Brazil didn't have a strong basic health system. The services lack uh, human resources, lack uh, uh, financial resources. So at that time, this way, to implement a public health intervention, the verticalized way, the verticalized approach was the only approach that would work. So the centralized method was worth. But the situation is completely different nowadays. Brazil uh, passed through uh, in, the next, in the last decades through, through a process that uh, the basic health service was strengthened. And that was uh, enable uh, SUS to work in a decentralized way. The, the, the circumstances now are completely different and uh, I believe that this uh, 
all this discussion uh, about uh, verticalized or the horizontal approach, actually nowadays it, it lost a little bit of the sense because uh, actually if you, if you strengthen your whole basic health system, you can accomplish even the highest uh, 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 priorities uh, through public health interventions as eradicating a disease. As long as all your system is autonomous, homogenic, and you can provide the service uh, through an integrated perspective to all your population. So you don't need anymore a strong centralized program, a strong centralized process. And we must be aware of that and uh, be very careful to don't use historical events to justify uh, our uh, new different approaches with nowadays different situation. I think that was uh, the former American pro uh, president Barack Obama that said that we are entitled to our own opinion, but we are not entitled to our own facts. So the fact now is that the Brazilian system is strengthened. Of course, it's not a, a, an ideal system. It must be uh, even further strengthened, but it's different than in the 50s and the 60s that actually a strong centralized command was needed to accomplish the, the goal. So yeah, your, 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 your comment was uh, useful to understand that we must analyze different historical moments with different perspectives. Can I just make one comment? Like, because it's really quite interesting because Nepal, I need to emphasize, didn't have a health system throughout the country. So it was achieved despite not having the health system, which is why it's but within the region, the idea was that you are going to eradicate it if you didn't have basic health services. I need to emphasize Nepal didn't have basic health services. So most people, could, there was no health service to access. Um, I think so I sort of just want to emphasize that point. Other comments, questions? Sir? say that this question uh, that you're raising right now, it was raised during the, the, the in 1958 when the program was uh, at discussion at the WHA. The problem is that if you take out vaccination from a society, disease will strike and obviously the society will be aware of that and people will die. But if you introduce vaccine in a society, the disease will be forgotten. And actually, it, the oppose will start to happen because uh, a few people, you, you need to think the perspective here that needs to be brought, and few people would start to present uh, side effects of the vaccine. And that will be the, 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 the most important news in, in, in the press, that the vaccine is doing harm. But I, I truly believe that that's a role for the public health officials to educate the society, the population, that if we take out vaccination and disease strike, the, the, project, the, the harm will be even worse. So uh, there needs to be a balance 
and in 1958 the discussions with the, 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 the developed countries was exactly that that they support smallpox eradication because in their country it was starting to become hard to convince the society that they need to vaccinate because side effects, few people that got side effects from vaccines they were started to be, uh, uh, the, their voices were louder than those few people that still got the disease. So I think that it's, it's, a, it's a question to be, to, to be open to the society, honest to the society, to put the balance in the table, to justify that vaccination is extremely important in a society level, and uh, we can see what has happened with measles in, in 2018, 2017, a huge outbreak. Maybe it's time to understand that a major outbreak is a good point to start to talk about the eradication of disease that is completely preventable. Because if we do that, we control the outbreak, people will start to complain about the eradication of a vaccine that might have few side effects. So it's, it's a matter of to, 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 to show to the society, as I said, seek political commitment, political support, because eventually we will control the disease again and the, the vaccine side effect will start to, to, to be highlighted opposed to the, the effects of the disease itself. So it needs to be negotiated with society, specifically with political leaders, and understand the specific points when to start our eradication program. So uh, health education, I think, is the, the key, not only to the society, but to our political leaders also. If I had to, you, you, you go, no, 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 no. I think this is also linked to this whole concept of herd immunity. <coughs> you know, I mean, the whole idea behind vaccinating 80% of people was that even if a few are left off, you know, the 80% the who are vaccinated sort of, sort of prevent any kind of disease from turning into an epidemic. Yeah, it, it depends on the disease, but in the case of smallpox, what was uh, accepted as 80% of the population. We must bear in mind that uh, when we say about 80 or 90% of the population, 95% of the population, uh, we, we can't do the calculation on the number of vaccination in a population. We must to achieve 95% in the case of measles, for example, in all the population, we must not let small pockets of people unvaccinated because they will be susceptible to the disease and the virus start, will continue to, to, to circulate. So uh, uh, eradication programs and vaccination is another example as John told about universal health coverage. It's, it, it, it's important to cover the whole society and don't leave pockets of people susceptible to disease and infections. I want to talk about that actually part of that we actually need to look at the reasons um, and, and I want to go back to the time of the smallpox campaign and looking at why people did or didn't accept vaccination because from the um, the pilot project there are one or two um, there are comments for, but it's it's a lot um, we need to be thinking from the level of people and thinking upwards, not just the health professionals. Down. People didn't um, vaccinate. As I say, I didn't get to talk about, say, belief in the, the goddess um, Sitala, uh, and some people were against, but that didn't necessarily mean you couldn't vaccinate. But they were, people had, they had side effects from previous variolation. Vaccinators came, they did at, at the time when people were out at work mm. in, in the fields. There's lots of practical issues and things that it, it became as if that those implementing the projects needed to listen to people and work at what was sort of going on. So really getting down to the local um, level. It's, it's more than just going out and saying, you need to do this or you should do that. Even when they knew um, about, and as I say, smallpox was a common childhood illness, but they had varying attitudes towards vaccination. Um, so it's a lot more complex than that, and I think we really need to sort of get back to focusing on what went on in that period. I've done a number of interviews with people who I call 
the grandmothers, people who had children who died of smallpox or got smallpox, or they themselves had smallpox. Um, so their stories are, are, are quite different. And I think it's really important that when we look at the eradication campaign, um, and this, we need to look at what that wider, that wider picture. It's a, it's a lot more complicated. And there's some heart-rending stories, obviously, in there. I think this, okay, very quick final. No, no, you go ahead, because he's a member of our center. <laughs> <laughs> I can talk to him. Yes, yeah, but uh, because we are running out of time, and the gentleman has to go home. Um, but please, very quick. Oh, thank you. Um, I, I was just curious about, um, because in, in a way, we've all been talking about the silences in mm. history. Um, and and I just want, I'm just interested in sort of thoughts about why these silences. And in a way, I, I thought it would be it would be interesting. You know, if this was a, a book, it would be interesting to have a chapter on the local story of the WHO. Mm -hmm. And you know, who was this Henderson? And you know, these characters, and where did they get? You know, why was he so anxious about India not wanting help? And and um, you know, as you said. Mm -hmm. Nepal was a, a global story too. Mm. You know mm. this idea about what's global and what's mm. local. And if it, yeah. yeah, and and so you know, I, I was just wondering, you know, was it something about the, you know the institutional culture? Was it was there a sort of political economy, or was there something about these individuals and their backgrounds? You know, I don't know whether they were sons and daughters of colonial officers. I just wonder what the story is, also uh, about um, you know the WHO and and you know how do we begin to understand? You know, we need to, in a way, we need to sort of um, sort of reveal what these silences have, have hidden, but also understand why, why these silences happen. Okay. Um, that's partly what I'm trying to do because I got into started on on stop smallpox in Nepal because I read about this epidemic in the Everest region, and it just wasn't any, um, it wasn't anywhere. And even the official camp talks about 1958, not 1963, as the epidemic. And yet this epidemic, it does appear in, inter there's some numbers in internationals at the WER, but it's just for Kathmandu. The Everest area doesn't, but there's newspaper reports because of the climbing expeditions reporting, reporting that. So it's, um, so I think it's a fascinating sort of topic and it's one of the things that, but I wonder, you know, why, for example, in this epidemic, um, is there nothing? Um, you know, it, it doesn't it appear into the records. And the other X one, the Langjong, sort of the the two volunteers, really surprised. Didn't even get into the the um, Peace Corps' own sort of history. They're really put out, um, sort of about that acknowledgement. And we have all these gaps and things. So I'm trying in my because it's a small program of things, I can actually go down to the level of the individual, which is what I want to try and increasingly um, explore. Um, but I think it's a fascinating area. I think let's continue these discussions um, after the event. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for attending. Thank you very much for presenting. I think it's been a fascinating set of mm -hmm. discussions, which provided us much food for thought. Thank you very much. Thank you.